What's up, guys? This is Pat, and before we get into the episode, just a quick reminder to please hit that subscribe button and leave us a rating and review. Also, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, at The Founder Hour. All right, here we go. What's happening, everybody? Welcome to the Founder Hour podcast. I am your co-host, Posh. I'm Pat. And we are so excited to be here today with Simon Huck, who is the co-founder of Judy, and he has a lot of other titles as well, which he's going to tell us about shortly. Uh, Quick story. It took us about 25 minutes to get this all figured out because of technology failing us, but it's okay. Here we are. It's basically like the new replacement of the commute time here in LA. Uh, So you know, it balances out. It's the same thing. But Simon, thanks for being on with us. I know you're out in New York. So thank you for taking the time. Thank you for having me. Excited to be here. I'm glad we figured out this technology nightmare. (laughs) We made it happen. Uh, So (laughs) kind of before we get into your story, uh, tell us kind of how everything has been for you in the last couple months, you know, during this quarantine period. How have you been dealing with it? What's something that maybe you just didn't do before that you started doing that, you know, you're like, wow, I'm going to I'm going to keep doing this. So it's, it's interesting because you would think that I would be spending more time on social media because we're at home and there's not much to do. And over the last five weeks, I have taken considerable time away from my phone. So we have a rule that like after 637, that there's no more phone time in, in, our, in our apartment. And part of that was spurred, I would say, in the first two weeks when I was on so many different group chats and every other person was sending another link or another media story that, you know, did not help my anxiety. I was not sleeping at night and and it became kind of this like nonstop news cycle over text and over social media that I realized that this was going to be something that was going to happen for a long term, like I needed to check out. So that's something it's been a huge behavioral change for me. Yeah, I think I think what this whole thing did is really exploit that the the negative side of being just overly connected with everybody in the world and like how much how how quickly news can travel and then you know usually when it's it's bad news and it's constantly bad news then then it doesn't really help anything. So, I think I think like I think I'm in the same boat. I've definitely tried to spend less time in social media too, but um yeah, so uh, let's kind of go back uh, and, and and learn about your like upbringing, and 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 we can kind of talk about what you're up to now. But tell us a little bit about your background. Um, I think I saw you grew up in Canada, so tell us a little bit about your childhood and what kind of things you were into. So yeah, no, the story starts in Ottawa, Canada, which is the nation's capital. People people often think that it's Toronto, but it's Ottawa. It's a much smaller city. And I think from a very early age, maybe I watched a movie or read a book, but I thought that like, I was going to be a lawyer. Like that to me sounded like the appropriate statement. Like I'm going to be a lawyer. I knew nothing about, I have no lawyers in my family. I really didn't know what that meant, but I thought corporate attorney sounds like the kind of slogan for Simon Huck. And I went into school um, with a major in political science. Still at that point, didn't really know what I was going to do, but kind of kept true to my um, canned response of I'm going to be an attorney. And then in third year, uh, I was finishing up my degree. A friend of mine who had been studying at a, at a college in Toronto, communication said, Simon, you would be the most incredible publicist. Like this is the career for you. And at the time, I thought that PR was event planning. I, I thought I was going to be like, figuring out how to do like flower sculptures at like a wedding. I had no, in Canada, I mean, there is of course corporate communications, but there isn't PR in the way that we think of PR nowadays, which is in almost every facet of marketing. Um, So, you know, 18 years ago, 17 years ago, I made the, the move from Kingston, Ontario, where I was finishing my degree and moved to New York City for an unpaid internship working for a woman named Lizzie Grubin. And Simon, what do you think, or what do you think your friend saw in you uh, that made him believe that you would be a good publicist? I, it was my friend, Melissa, and she had, she has been a very close friend of mine for years. And 
I think she saw my natural ability to connect other people, whether it was, you know, hosting events at our, you know, college apartment, or whether it was hosting these larger kind of charity functions, fundraisers, we call them mixers. Um, I loved connecting people. And I would say I did okay in school, but I felt like I had very high emotional intelligence. So being able to read the room, being able to introduce different people and, and hoping that they would connect in the same way that I connected with them. I think, you know, you hear so many different people talk about emotional intelligence, but I think some of the most incredible entrepreneurs and mentors that I've had have really taught me to hone those skills. Um, you know, when you're making a pitch to someone, whether it's a new idea, whether it's an investment, whatever it is, being able to read that person is really critical to your success. And who was one of your mentors, I guess, or several of them in this space or in this specific topic that helped you learn those skills or not even learn, but really hone those skills and really use that high EQ to your advantage? So I moved here just to set the stage. I moved here from Kingston, Ontario. I had a relatively normal upbringing, you know, middle class upbringing. And I was reading a tabloid. I was 20 years old. I was reading a tabloid. I was reading Us Weekly. And I, I've, been a, I've been star obsessed since I was 16. And I read an article about Lizzie Grubman. And Lizzie had an MTV show called Power Girls. And it called her a publicity princess. And I thought, holy shit, that is glamorous. And I need to <clears throat> jump on that bandwagon. So I picked up the phone and I called her off as 150,000 times. And I finally got someone to pick up and they agreed to meet with me. If I would happen to be in New York City, they would take the meeting. So I lied to my parents. I said I had a job interview, flew down to New York, you know, two days later. I had been to New York once before and stayed for 24 hours and was awestruck by everything. And for whatever reason, I don't know how or why, but Lizzie and her then partner, Jonathan Chebin, you know, quote unquote, hired me. It was an unpaid internship. I was like the coffee guy. Three, three days a week. And that really started my kind of foray into New York City and foray into entertainment PR. And Jonathan at the time had this partnership with Lizzie, but he also had a very successful business called Command PR. And I'll say being from Canada and being so unknown, I was so incredibly intimidated by everything. I mean, I would go to dinners. I remember I went to a dinner at Nobu. I was 20 years old. You know, to me, Nobu was this fancy restaurant that like celebrities frequent. I was so, I can't, I look back and I think, oh my God, how did I get through any of these conversations without being so nervous? And Jonathan taught me, you know, less like a uh, fake it till you make it, but having the confidence to walk into some of these meetings and be in these situations and not necessarily always show that kind of naivety. Um, and really was a mentor to me for 10 years after I started working for Lizzie. I mean, after uh, Lizzie and Jonathan's partnership split up, I went to go work for him in 2007. And then in 2010, we became partners. And then 2012, uh, I bought the business from him. So it sounds like obviously you did really well, even though you, you can't remember why they hired you at the, at the time. I'm assuming it was because you were just really persistent and just want, like they, they could tell that you really wanted to work with them. Um, but I guess, uh, can you speak on maybe like what are some of the things looking back that you did or you tried to focus on that really made you successful in, in PR? I think curiosity and kind of like unbridled enthusiasm. I was so curious and I was the first person in the office, whether it was 6.30 in the morning, I was the last person to leave the office. I was so grateful. I could not, I still can't. I could not believe that you could have a job doing what we were doing. You know, this is a kid from Canada who within three months was, you know, working Diddy's white party. I was doing Jennifer Lopez's birthday. I was organizing red carpets with hundreds of photographers and broadcast crews from across the world for these huge red carpet events. This in my wildest dreams, I never thought that this could be a career and nor did I ever think that I would have access to this type of career. I was probably unbearable on Facebook and gloating about everything along the way, but it was such a, it, it happened so quickly. 
And, you know, I, I, I talk about this a lot with friends. It's like, who was that 20 year old kid who took that risk? Because I want to access him so much more, you know, in my thirties, it's like, you become so risk adverse as you realize how hard things are. But at, at 20, I was like, oh, for sure, I'm going to move to New York. I, I didn't even process like the ramifications of what I was thinking. I mean, I had this political science degree, like I had other options I could have done, but um, I think you need to have that. You need to have that perspective, just especially when you're young to say, okay, I, I can afford to make some mistakes and take some big risks. And Simon, you talk about several things that happened between, you know, 2007 and 2012 when you bought the business uh, from Jonathan. Tell us a little bit about those earlier days working at Command and what are the types of things that you were working on and what did you learn? I know you talk a lot about social media later on and more recently and that, you know, the influence that that has had and the impact that, that has had. But early on, you know, what were the things that you were doing? Who are the types of people that you were working with? And uh, just tell us a little bit about that experience working with Jonathan early on before we get into you buying the business. So we were, and it's even to this day, I think uh, this industry is so niche. It's, it can be sometimes confusing. Um, oftentimes I'm associated with representing talent, but what my agency does, it's called Command Entertainment Group. We're one of the biggest talent buyers in the country and we help brands. So big CPG brands. Um, negotiate their brand deals with celebrities. So when you're watching a Super Bowl commercial and you see Celebrity Y hawking shampoo, I am the agency that connected the brand with the celebrity. So whether that is uh, a photo op to an event appearance to a 360 brand deal, we are the agency that really helps brands from A to Z. Um, we help develop their strategy of how to work with celebrities. We develop um, new partnerships with them. And I mean, the way that celebrity has changed from when I first started, where you were really only working with traditional actors and actresses. And now, you know, influencer culture has changed the game. I mean, there's so many different ways to work with celebrities. Um, so that was really the beginning. So Jonathan and I were really at the very beginning of this celebrity craze, if you will. I mean, now it's, it, you would find it hard pressed to find a marketing campaign that didn't involve some version of celebrity or influencer. Um, right. And then during, you know, that uh, tenure with Jonathan, we also did a reality show or a docudrama show called the spin crowd, which was executive produced by Kim Kardashian. And it was a show chronicling life behind the velvet rope. So giving viewers a taste of what our life was like at our PR firm. Um, and we did one season of it. It was incredible. Uh, I, I learned very soon into that experience that life in front of the camera was not where I, where I wanted to be. And interestingly enough, Jonathan realized that the life in front of the camera is where exactly where he was supposed to be. And that was kind of a natural segue for us to kind of go on our merry way. I, I, I acquired half of the, the 100% of the business. Um, at the time, we were 50-50 partners, and he went on to now do you know, TV and podcasts and everything else. For you personally, I know um, a lot of people who might watch TV shows or reality shows especially and, and see the people in it, they, they assume that they love it. Like they, they're like, you know, that's their thing and they, they enjoy it. But for you personally, like why, why was it something that you weren't comfortable with? Like what, what's something that maybe people don't know about that space that they should know about? Well, and you, you hear this all the time and I am, and I am one of those people too, where it's like, woe is me. You know, you're making millions of dollars a year and you're documenting your life. There's, there's careers where you, you know, obviously, you know, there's things that people do that are very stressful or manual. I mean, you could think of a hundred different careers, um, that deserve a lot more praise than being a quote unquote reality star. But what you don't realize is that you have cameras following you, you know, up to 16 hours a day. And part of being on a show, you have a crew of 30 people who are counting on you to showcase every aspect of your life. That's the good, the bad, and the ugly. So yes, it's great to celebrate your successes on the show, but on the days where you're being the most vulnerable, and, and that's what makes good TV. If you look at the most successful TV franchises in the reality space, like the Kardashians, they are showing the good, the bad, and the ugly. You know, there are moments, obviously, when people don't want to show those moments. And, and to be honest, I didn't feel comfortable showing those moments. I didn't want every aspect of my life 
to be out there. And it takes a certain person to be really good at that and to know how to handle that and to deal with the anxiety of that. And I don't think I was ever hardwired for it. And when did you first, you know, you, you mentioned being like this person who was obsessed with pop culture and, you know, read us weekly and all these different tabloids, like early on at 16 years old, when did you first get introduced to the Kardashians and all these other folks that were a part of your uh, journey? Kim and I met in 2007 and this is before, uh, the Kardashians were a household name. This is before Kim even had a TV show. And I remember the day she told me that she got a call from Ryan Seacrest and they were thinking of doing a reality show. And at the time, reality, the only reality that I knew of was the Anna Nicole Smith show, which was on E and E really wasn't E like it is now. And one of the incredible things, which I'm going to tie back into Judy is you develop these friendships these, you know, 10 year friendships that um, are so important to, you know, your life. And what ends up happening is some of the people that you started with have then grow into these kind of, you know, massive household names. I mean, a lot of the people that I began my career with that I was doing smaller deals with in 2007, 2008 are now household names. It is an incredible um, journey. And it's one that um, I look back and I can't, I can't believe it. But it is, um, I mean, I think a lot of people in our industry feel that way because when you've been in the industry long enough, you, you see kind of the rise of so many different people. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And I think, um, I, I, I think that a lot of people might be wondering, like, how do you even put yourself in the position to meet these people that are working on like really cool stuff and maybe haven't blown up yet and, and they will eventually and you want to help each other and kind of go through that journey together. So I guess for you, like, was it because was it was like command PR like representing Kim or like was that what did you meet no, her through PR? It was, was it purely like it was different? it was a purely social meeting. It was a purely social meeting. And you know, when I when you're in entertainment PR, you're often throwing events, you're throwing um different activations, you're doing different deals. Like you're suddenly into a world where you're meeting a ton of people. And I can't stress this enough that in every, you know, in every career, you need to constantly meet people. And I I think networking gets a really bad rap. But the ability to develop meaningful relationships, even at the time, I mean, I think what I see a lot in younger generations is that they immediately assess a relationship, a network, a networked relationship on what that person can do for them immediately. And you know, back then, I wasn't thinking about strategy, I was just finding meaningful relationships and meaningful friendships. And 15 years later, I have all these incredible people who I have who've supported me and subsequently I have supported. Um, And it allows me to go do things like Judy, and have a network of people who can then support me um, and 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 support whatever else I want to work on. And as these relationships grew with all these people that you had met, you know, now 13 years ago, 12, 13 years ago, did, did, did you kind of grow with them and their businesses and see what they were doing and provide the value that you were providing to them as well? Or you completely separated your friendship and your business? It's really, it's a, it would be a case by case basis, but we would, there's often opportunities where you're able to mix friendship with business, where there's opportunities where I'm working on deals that I think of would be great for certain people. Part of being a quote unquote talent broker is making sure that when you give recommendations to a client of, oh, this celebrity would be perfect for your campaign is knowing a lot about the talent that you're speaking about. You know, would they consider something like this you know, are they interested in the beauty space? Are they interested in the fitness space? So when I look at my team, they're all experts in whatever vertical. So we have someone who does sports deals all day long. We have someone who does fitness and beauty deals. They need to know everything about the celebrities that we're recommending to our clients um, because the interests need to be aligned. Mm. So yeah, we talk about kind of just the whole space of of PR and and connecting talent with brands and 
um, this whole industry that has changed a lot in the last like 30 years. But how do you see, uh, obviously like the mediums change, but the 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 also the talent changes like who who is considered an influencer or someone with talent today might not have been someone that would be considered you know a talented 20 30 years ago so how do you see this whole landscape like changing in the next maybe 10 years and like into the future we are going to keep seeing more and more niche categories um we're going to see people who are working in certain spaces and verticals, and they are going to start um, generating more deals. So, for example, HTD, HGTV stars are doing incredibly well during COVID-19 because there's so much content that they can do in and around their home. There's, um, they tend to be great at documenting a lot of that content, so they're great content generators. So... What is so interesting is that when we start, started, you know, this when I started 15, 16 years ago, you were really only working with those traditional actors and actresses and social media wasn't part of the deals. And now you see a lot of celebrities who resisted being on social media who are no longer able to participate in this influencer economy. You know, I don't know. I can't think of a celebrity in the last five years I've done an endorsement with that has not been active on Instagram. Mm. Yeah, it's like sometimes I see these names that I recognize as like massive names from when I was a kid, and I, and I see on Instagram and they have like barely any activity or any following, and I just right. wonder like why? <laughs> why? Because they're resistant to this new world where they feel like they need to show, you know, parts of their life that they're not comfortable showing. And in and, and which I respect it's if you're an actor or actress, like just because you um, want to be in movies or be in TV doesn't necessarily mean you should have to um, sign up for Instagram and show off, you mm -hmm. know, your favorite tequila recipe or whatever. But if you want to play in the commercial endorsement space, you do need to be active. And Simon, speaking of social media, and obviously even that's changed, right? We have new platforms like TikTok that are now growing exponentially, especially during this COVID crisis where everybody's at home, like has nothing really to do and they're creating content. Uh, but I know that the price tag for a lot of this stuff, especially for celebrities who you work with, is extremely high, right? And I see all these celebrities posting, you know, stuff on their feed or their stories or whatever. And I'm thinking to myself, how do these brands even afford to pay these celebrities? So why don't you talk to us a little bit about that world of how the transactions actually take place? You know, somebody like Kim is charging perhaps upwards of a million dollars, right? Who's working with her or who's working with these folks? I can't, you know, I don't represent Kim, so I can't speak to, to her yeah. fees. Um, but in terms of industry trends, big brands are looking at social media posts, just like they would be looking at TV commercials. And they're making a financial decision and a financial investment. So if you're able to work with an influencer that has 30 million viewers and 30 million followers, and they have, let's say, a 4% conversion rate, you can make that financial decision. And it may make more sense than having a prime time spot on CNN. I mean, you can do like these brands are making decisions um, from a brand equity perspective, but they're also a, they're financial decisions. So we have seen deals that we have done where the cost of the post um, was a fraction of the return. Really? Like, could you, because could you, you give have us to ask yourself, like I mean, I couldn't give you an example because we're under NDA under all of them, but um, I, I think that I would reverse the question and say, why would brands continue to spend the money on influencer posts if there was not a return on investment? And to that point, yeah. you know, I know, I know in, in different certain types of marketing, like there is more data to, to make those decisions on like, you know, how much I'm putting X amount here and I'm getting X amount out as a return. But sometimes when it comes to like branding and um, different types of just branding campaigns that that ROI isn't as as easily you know uh, like the data isn't as easily um, there. So so how 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 is it that is that a challenge when it comes to like branding in general? I think you want to be careful 
first of all, you know, I, I often tell young brands, you know, DTC brands that are starting out, if your brand is um, successful, you're going to have loyalists and evangelists and people who love whatever your problem is that your brand is solving. And start the relationship with a celebrity or influencer, send them product, introduce yourself on Instagram, you know, reach out to their assistant, start to have an informal line of communication. And so when you go time to see if you can work on a larger deal, there's already an existing relationship. And if you have an existing relationship, you will get a preferred rate. I mean, celebrities, influencers, people want to work with brands that they already have a natural relationship to. Um, we've all seen commercials or endorsements where you cringe because you feel that whoever that spokesperson is, it does not feel like a natural fit. Mm. Yeah. You know, one thing that I'm really interested in, and, and don't get me wrong, I love the celebrities, probably not as much as you, uh, but I follow them, and I follow them more so in the business sense, right? And I really admire how they function, and, you know, specifically the Kardashians and the Jenners and, uh, you know, what they've been able to build. You know, having spent a lot of time with them, what are some of the business lessons that you've learned uh, while you've been building command. And then obviously, as we talk about Judy, I'm also curious on the brand building side of things and growing that, what you've learned. But specifically, you know, with the PR firm and really expanding that and, you know, growing, what are some of the business lessons you've learned from whether it's Chris or Courtney or Kim? Like, I'm curious. I really, I feel like we don't hear about that much. I, I wouldn't even say it's specific to them, but specific to the industry as a whole um, in terms of, how can you develop this brand, you know, year one and take it to year five to year 10? I think you need to, and we hear this so often, but it, 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 it's, it's so true. You need to be authentic and figure out what is your lane? Like, are you a beauty influencer? Is beauty your obsession? Are you a lifestyle influencer? You know, what does that mean? Do you like travel? Like, figure out what your lane is and because if you are, are at all, and we hear this in, in deals all the time where someone says, a celebrity says to us, we want to do a makeup line or we want to do a vodka line. You know, after George Clooney sold his brand for $700 million, you get a ton of celebrities who are thinking, wait a minute, uh, I can do this. I can do it. If you don't have a natural, genuine connection to what, what you are doing, you're following your community, they can feel it. and the reason why the girls, for example, have been so successful is that they, everything that they work on, they have an authentic connection to. And the most successful partnerships across the board with celebrities are ones where there is a genuine relationship between the brand um, and the celebrity. And I think that that's, that's a great point. And I think it's something that applies to people that are also not celebrities, right? People that are starting businesses that they might not be perhaps passionate about or have, you know any sort of connection to right like if i start like a skincare line I, I mean it's not that i don't think skincare is important but it's not something that i'm genuinely passionate right. and authentic you know it's, it's i can make it work but it's not gonna blow up right and it just right. doesn't make sense so i think that the lessons that you know we learn from folks that we see the celebrities should be you know stay authentic and i think we see that even on social media even when Kim does something that's like off brand, it's very obvious, right? You're like, I don't know. I don't know if that's going to work as well because we don't really believe that you really believe that. So that's an interesting lesson. I guess going and diving into Judy, how did that even come up? I know it launched recently, but talk to us about how, your thought process before you even launched. So for the last five to six years, I have had several close friends who've been involved in emergencies. So I have several friends who lost their homes in the Southern California wildfires. I have friends who've been in some of the hurricanes that have hit the Atlantic coast. And the common denominator in each one of these situations was a fundamental lack of preparedness. So most of the people um, had no emergency plan in place. Um, let alone in an emergency kit. And when I asked them, you know, how did you talk to your family about emergencies? Did you have an emergency plan? Did you have, you know, a safety plan? You know, all of them looked at me with like a blank face. And 
what I realized, you know, very early on was that emergencies and emergency planning was something that no one was talking about. And I met with my co-founder, who's been a friend of mine for years, and he started working on something in the emergency food space, um, figuring out how to make emergency food taste delicious. And I said, I'm interested in this space. And I shared my stories. And we started looking into what brands right now are talking to American families about safety and preparedness. And we, I remember the day we called two former FEMA and Red Cross emergency preparedness instructors. And, you know, they said to us, this is the, one of the biggest challenges facing Americans right now. As storms get worse, we become less prepared. You know, 60% of Americans have no emergency plan in place in the event of an emergency. And what we have seen with COVID-19 is rampant misinformation, um, incredible anxiety levels, as we talked about earlier, uh, panic purchasing. You know, what did we see the first weekend of COVID? We saw toilet paper, uh, paper towel. I mean, people raided the stores um, unnecessarily. So all of the things that we had for 18 months as we were talking and building Judy, kind of all the things that you wanted to avoid suddenly happened within a matter of 48 hours. So Judy was, the genesis of Judy was personal stories and experiences, a problem that we identified and then a mission for me feeling like after 16 years of having all these incredible relationships and people who wanted to support me and me feeling like, you know, I had a little bit of an existential crisis where I thought, I love my celebrity business. I love my marketing company, but I need to do something that actually has an impact uh, bigger and, and bigger and more significant than, than what I'm doing on my every day. And Judy just felt like that kind of perfect hybrid. Yeah, and this is one of those things where I can imagine, you know, the reason why a lot of people don't think ahead of time and don't have this is because like they they might it might not have occurred to them some like, you know, something really disastrous or like a, someone that they know so they don't really see the need to go through all this I don't know, whatever you want to call it, inconvenience or time or whatever yeah. to like have to put together this stuff. And so how do you get people to realize how serious it is for them to to think ahead of time until you know, before it's too late. So exactly, uh, 100%, um, the, the challenge is twofold. So firstly, uh, most people think that emergencies are not going to happen to them. And then the other cohort of people think that if an emergency does happen, there's nothing they can do to prepare for it. And, you know, lastly, I'll say that no one wants to talk about worst case scenarios. I mean, I myself was so poorly prepared before I started Judy. I mean, I didn't even know. I have fire extinguishers. We have two fire extinguishers in our apartment. I had no idea. How, I, I mean, I would not know what to do with the fire extinguisher. Mm -hmm. I didn't know, you know, the cadence of when I needed to replace my smoke detector battery or my or where my carbon monoxide detector was. I didn't know anything about fire safety. You know, there were so many blind spots in my life. And you know, part of the challenge at Judy is figuring out how do we talk about emergencies in a way that doesn't scare people because we know that, that shuts people down. And, you know, what we just did, and I know we're going to talk about this in a sec, is using levity and pop culture and um, optimism to empower people to do something about their preparedness plan. So you really got to get their attention. So what can you do to get people's attention? You've got to be clever and you have to think of you know, marketing campaigns that will draw attention and will give people enough that they can do. I mean, we often talk internally at Judy about like a 15% in change in behavior. So if you can change your behavior by 15%, if you can have that conversation with your family, you know, you're just, you're so much better off. Right. And like a lot of times, like we see companies create these innovative, you know, product services, ways of doing things, but it's so foreign to people that it's hard to get the message across. So like, to your point, it's like, if you, how can you tie that to something that they're familiar, familiar with, uh, whether it's through pop culture or something that just like the, the masses or just no, like it could be like, uh, nostalgia for all we know, it could be something that like, you know, you, you have this connection with that makes people understand, you know, okay, like I'm going to, I'm willing to give this a shot. Right. Yeah, and on, yeah, and on exactly. top of that, and on top of that, also, I think that we just kind of live in this society where, you know, prevention isn't necessarily sexy. It's 
you know, the cure is what's sexy, the solution. But, you know, you look at it even in healthcare, right? You see this during the COVID crisis, like America was unprepared, right? The hospital system wasn't ready. That's why we're sheltering at home. So, you know, how do you change that behavior and say, hey, you know, get this ahead of time. You may not use it, which is fantastic, but because that means that there's no emergency happening. But in the case that there is, great, you're prepared, right? Like, how do you tell somebody that there's value in something that they may never have to use, right? And that's, I feel like, an uphill battle. It, it, it can be an uphill battle. I'll say that what we learned three months into this is that more important than an emergency kit is the education and the wherewithal to know what to do in the event of an emergency. So if you are listening to this right now, yes, we want you to buy an emergency kit. If you don't want to buy an emergency kit from Judy, um, assemble your own emergency kit. But the number one thing you need to do, even before having the physical products, is having the information of what to do. Because so many people think, and we've heard this time and time again from people who've been in emergencies, that when an emergency happens, they're going to know what to do. You know, how many people um, do you know who've been in an emergency and they're type A, rational, you know, intelligent people who make decisions that you think, wait a minute, why did you walk back into the home without your shoes on when there was a fire in your living? Like, we go through a state of almost emotional paralysis when we're in an emergency and you don't realize that your brain's not working because you know, the adrenaline's kicking and you're running to get your kids out of the bedroom. And there's so many things that are going on that if you don't have that conversation before about your emergency plan, about what to do, about the the extra, the window in the basement that opens if you need to escape, like all of those kind of tough conversations you have as a family, those are the conversations that quite literally will save your life. Yeah. And, and, and I think you mentioned earlier, like, how do you do that without scaring people or, or scaring people away, you know, and, and not creating this state of panic. And, and one thing I think about is like, you know, as kids, like in, in school, we learn about what to do during a fire drill. And now, unfortunately, kids are learning about what to do if there's like a school shooting or something like really right. bad. Um, I feel like this is something that should also be taught in schools at a young age. So like, as you grow older, and, and maybe you could even be the person in the house to understand what to do if your parents are a little bit older and don't really care or not don't want to change their ways. It's like, how do you educate the younger people um, in school where they are and they're, where they're supposed to be learning on how to deal with these like real life issues? Well, it's so true. And we do these classes. Uh, we started them in California. We've had to stop them because of COVID, where we bring in our master class, Judy instructor, and we have 30 parents who sit around in a circle, and we have a demonstration about emergency preparedness. And these parents are enthralled. They have their notebooks. You know, they're copying down everything. They they come with questions. You know, we end up staying until one in the morning every time. But what's interesting, and this has happened, we've done 12 of these classes, and every time, you know, the kids somehow creep into the conversation. Suddenly, they're sitting on their parents' laps. And these kids, some of whom are seven or eight, know more about emergency drills than their parents. So drop, cover, and hold on, which is basic earthquake you know, preparedness. Most of the parents did not know what to do. And most of them, when we ask them you know, simple disaster IQ questions like where, what to do during an earthquake, we're saying all the things that you were not supposed to do. And in fact, the kids were able to answer because it was something mandatory that they were constantly learning about um, in school. But what happens when you graduate? It's no longer mandatory. And People forget, and we have short-term memory when it comes to these kind of things. Even when we think about COVID, it's what are we going to learn from this moving forward about preparedness? Um, what are we going to learn? How are we going to change our, our patterns of behavior to be better prepared um, for the next large-scale emergency? Simon, talk to us a little bit about the branding, right? Like, how did you come up with the name Judy, the color, you know, the the, the orange that sticks out, right? what goes into it. I think a lot of people that are starting businesses or want to are very curious about the branding side of things, especially, you know, in this day of day and age where you as a person attach yourself to a brand based on people like you who are the creators and the founders or based on, you know, what it stands for. So really curious about uh, hearing that story. We went through 
a very arduous process because the challenge for us is how do we uh, create an emergency system that is functional, um, but also, I hate to use the word stylish, but but aesthetically pleasing. What we did not want to create is something that felt gimmicky or glamorous or, you know, quote unquote mm -hmm. chic, because the minute you attribute those things to your product, it minimizes the importance of what the product is supposed to do. It should not look like a mini bar. This is, these are life-saving products, but we realize that there needs to be a balance of organization. So right now, if you're on Amazon, you're buying a pre-assembled emergency kit, it arrives and it's just a ton of disparate products thrown into a knapsack. There's no organization. At Judy, we completely Marie Kondoified the system. Um, we hired Red Antler, which is a design agency based in Brooklyn. Um, they've done a ton of um, incredible DTC brands. And we went through a six month branding process. It was you know, a very tedious exercise. And we went through probably 10 different versions of Judy. And we knew that we wanted a name that people would never forget. We also wanted to personify who Judy was. So we all have a Judy in our life. And in my life, my Judy is a friend who shows up five minutes before our dinner reservation. The Judy who has hand sanitizer and wet wipes and everything else, God knows what else in her purse. And, you know, Judy's like my great grandmother, like there is personas of Judy and we all have that Judy in our life. And that is what Judy for us meant. And it's what we've seen with our community. People are constantly on, on Instagram share stories of like who their Judy is. Um, so that is actually how the, the name came about. That's awesome. <laughs> that's, I love that. I mean, yeah. yeah, like when you think of Judy, you just envision something and that's pretty much what it is. It's almost like, right. it's almost like Karen. Yeah, <laughs> totally. It, we could have been Karen. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm curious. So once we release the episode, we'll ask our audience who their Judies are. I'm curious about yeah. their responses. Yeah. So what's in it? I mean, I, I personally haven't. I don't have one yet. But what's in the box? So we have three different products. We have the um, starter, which is a bum bag, uh, a fanny pack that has eight different products in it. Um, and just to give you background on emergency kits, the foundations of all emergency kits are uh, water, food, and first aid. So those come in all of the Judy's. Um, we have the traditional go bag, which is called the mover in a two and four person configuration that has over 20 different emergency preparedness products inside of it. And then we have the quote unquote home appliance of preparedness, which is the safe. Um, and it has over 24 different products inside of it. Anything from a multi-tool to a hand crank radio um, to food, water, et cetera. And I think for us, when we think about what separates us is really making sure our customer and our community understands how the hell is my multi-tool going to help me in the emergency? And what do I need a hand crank radio for? So, so much of what Judy is all about is connecting our content with our community. So teaching people scenarios of when you would need a hand crank radio, teaching our community through our, our um, content system, all about what to do to prepare for hurricanes. We have a, a texting system where you can go onto our website and it's completely free of charge. And we send you texts and tips and videos. Um, of things you need to do to prepare for various emergencies. And we segment it. So we know if you live in Kansas versus California, we're sending you information based on what you're vulnerable for. Um, so it allows us to speak directly to our customer. That's awesome. And where do you see Judy going, right? Like, because when I think about it, you know, I see that there are emergencies in, in everyday life, right? Like, you know, whether it's while you're driving, which, you know, people are not doing much now, but they'll restart or while they're at work or when they're playing sports or, you know, when they're hanging out with friends, whatever. There's always these like little emergencies as well. It's not only the national and global crises that are now currently taking place. Do you see Judy playing a role in that space? Right. Like when I imagine like the fanny pack, I'm thinking, OK, if I'm a parent going to Disneyland, I'd like to have like. The Judy fanny pack is number one, you know, I'm sure it's going to look dope on my, like, you know, on my you know body. And number two, <laughs> like if my kid falls down or like something happens, like totally. I want to make sure that it's there. Right. So how do you so, see that happening with Judy? So a lot of our customers, and this is part of the unboxing experience um, that we share with our community. 
the Judy is not meant to be in your pantry underneath like your Christmas ornaments. Judy is meant to be, you know, unpa- un- unboxed and unpacked. So we have a lot of parents who talk to us that they've already used almost half of the products in their first aid kit. Um, you know, if you've got kids below the age of 10, they're getting scrapes and bruises on the playground. So Judy is not just for these large scale emergencies. It's for everyday family safety. Um, and part of that leads to kind of future products and things that we're thinking about at Judy is offering a Judy subscription. So if you look at an emergency kit, it's, it's comprised of consumables and expirables. So you want to be emergency ready 365 days a year. So some of our future products involve subscription. So how can we replenish the products that are expiring in the emergency kit and the products that we're already seeing are being used? So hand sanitizer, we already have a ton of our customers who said, listen, we've gone through all our hand sanitizer. Can you send us more? You know, Neosporin, um, masks. We have masks in our emergency kit that were initially designed for prevention and protection against wildfire smoke. And as you can see now, there's a, there's a massive mass shortage across the country. So, you know, all of these products, you know, when we think about it, these are all products that should be ingrained in our everyday life. There is no reason why at Target and Walmart and every other major department store that there isn't going to be a preparedness section, just like there's travel sections with like pint sized shampoos there should be a preparedness section where you can pick up all of these products. And that is Judy's vision. That's awesome. That's awesome. So kind of talking about Judy, the business, um, I can imagine it's a lot different than running like a PR or like a talent brokerage. So kind of, sh- kind of transitioning from that to, to this type of thing, like what's it been like for you and, and has it been a challenge? So it, it has definitely been a challenge. Every day is a new day. I'll say that one of the things that's different about this experience versus Command Entertainment Group is having a co-founder. So I knew that if I was going to do this, I had you know, some strengths that I knew would benefit to the business, but there were a lot of things that I knew I would need outside help for. And my co-founder, Josh Udashkin, is absolutely brilliant. He has um, had a CPG business before. He was in the luggage business. And he is a brilliant fundraiser. Um, he's a financial wizard. So modeling, you know, structuring our deal, you know, building out kind of the creative strategy for our business. There's so many different things that we're able to collaborate on. I had launched an experiential museum called A Human two years ago. And my biggest mistake when I launched it is I did it by myself. And I didn't have a person to call at 11 o'clock at night when I couldn't get to bed because I was ruminating on like the nine issues you do. And I think you guys probably know this as, you know, being partners in the podcast, like having someone to talk to, it's not for everyone, but I can't imagine doing future businesses without another person. Right. hundred percent. You know, and it's, I w- it's funny you bring that up because I was talking to somebody um, probably a couple of days ago or maybe yesterday and they were in a business on their own and now she's in this position where she's like i've like lost interest because like my san i'm like insane like i've lost insane. complete control of my sanity because i have nobody to complain with or nobody to celebrate with nobody to bounce ideas off of and or just balance it out because yeah. like you know it is it is a really tough gig and it's challenging and there's so many low points and if if you're low chances are if there's someone else that can you know help you get through that and then vice versa if, if right. someone else is low you can help them get through that otherwise it's just dependent on one person's you know feelings and one person's thought process for sure yeah and i mean like again like you said if one person's having a bad day and the other person's got to just pick up the slack right i mean like it's just like that's what the partnership is about it's the same in a relationship i'm sure you know that I mean, we both know yep. it i mean it just it's not perfect right like entrepreneurship is always at least these days, it seems like the sexiest thing to do. It's always rainbows and butterflies, but I mean, it's really kind of the opposite. It's, it's, t- it's challenging. It's tough, right? You know, you've had the relationships, you've built the connections, which has helped you kind of, you know, accelerate this a lot faster and, you know, take it to a place that maybe others couldn't have, but it's still a challenge, right? Right. At the end of the oh, day, like, people have to purchase the product or consume the everyone content. Everyone thought, like, I, I think that some people think that entrepreneurship it's almost like become its own version of influencer culture where like you see people's bylines like entrepreneur. And I look Mm -hmm. at it and I think, guys, do you have any idea what a nightmare the process can be? I mean, 
yes, I love it. Like the highs are so incredible and the lows are so devastating, but it is so many lonely nights. It is so many Saturday and Sundays and sleepless nights of worrying about, you know, one issue that turns into another issue and moments where you don't think you can get the investment to put your order in and, and, and unexpected, you know, surprises. I mean, there's, I feel like there's so many people out there listening who have businesses that are like, oh yeah, keep going, like keep that list going. And it's not to deter people from starting a business or, you know, building their idea, but this shit is real and it is really stressful and it's not for the faint of heart. And that, it goes back to our other point when we talk about, you need to love what you're doing. Like you need to be, if you're starting a makeup brand, you need to be a makeup guru. You need to eat, breathe, breathe, sleep, think only about makeup because it's going to define your life and it's going to take over your life and you need to have that passion. Yeah, exactly. And I think, um, like you said, like people are a little too attached to that word entrepreneur, the lifestyle of it. But I think the best thing people do personally is like, or can do is detach themselves from this lifestyle or the word and just focus on the task at hand. Like, what are you working on? What are you trying to improve on? What are you, what are you innovating? Like, do the work and whatever you're called down the line, you could be called something even better than an entrepreneur, like a, like a visionary, a mogul or whatever it might be. Like let other people call you that, right? Just focus on right. the shit that you're doing. 100%. <laughs> yeah. So Simon, before we jumped on the podcast, we had put like a post on social media for people to kind of comment and see what they'd like to ask you. So we got a few questions, if you don't mind uh, answering them. Some are related to business. Others are more uh, related to life and kind of your relationships. Uh, one of the questions that we got was you recently uh, launched a product related to the documentary Tiger King, right? Uh, people want to know a little bit about that. So part of the the challenge for emergency preparedness is getting people's attention. So we have to think of really creative ways to drive awareness and drive interest in getting people prepared for emergencies because they're just not. So we had an idea to partner with America's Food Fund and donate 100% of the proceeds and turn our home appliance product, which is called the safe, into a tiger safe. And we thought, what better way to drive excitement than to find John Finlay, which was Joe Exotic's first husband and star of the show, um, to do the voiceover for our campaign. And he was incredible. Um, and he was so excited about the campaign. And it has been tremendously successful. We have raised thousands upon thousands of dollars for America's Food Fund and also generated awareness around the importance of being prepared. Mm, that's awesome. Yeah, it's so important to just jump on it, like jump yeah. on those opportunities as soon as as soon as possible. Like, like it, it goes such a long way. Yeah, and like that's great. There's probably a lot of people thinking right now. Oh well, you know, you have like a celebrity broker agency, so like you were able to figure this out. No, I went on Facebook and I stalked him. I wrote him on DM. I like did every like. It wasn't like I went through some sort of formal channel. I. I think the tenacity you need to do these kind of things is, okay, what can I do that makes an impact that drives my business forward and drives my mission forward and also does something to give back during this time? I mean, what we've seen during COVID-19 is that individuals, businesses, organizations have stepped up to the plate and really delivered, you know, there's been so much kindness. There's been so much donation. Like you're seeing people really step up to the plate. And, and I think a lot of people feel really proud to be American. That's awesome. So another one we got here is, so uh, Patrick and I are both Armenian. And so we have a lot of Armenian friends. And when I asked the question, a couple of people asked me, and I, I rephrased it for them. They wrote, we in the Armenian circle are in awe of the Kardashian Jenner well-oiled machine. Uh, tell me what your friendship with the family means to you. So that's what they want us to ask you. They have been, because we've been friends prior to the show, it's like, I still think of them as the people that they were, you know, 12 years ago. And what is so incredible, because so many people change when you have that level of fame, they have stayed the exact same people. And so regardless of them or any of the other friends I've made along my journey, um, you know, friendships, you know, it's, 
this is like my chosen family. I'm my family lives in, in, in Canada. So all of my friendships mean the world to me. And they specifically have been so incredibly supportive of all of their friends, but of everything that I work on and, you know, are just, um, wonderful people. Yeah. And I feel like what people don't realize often is when you see someone who's had such a long period of success, right. in whatever they're doing, we talk about authenticity, like that's pretty much why, like, like for them to last that long, that sustainable kind of like lifestyle, if you're not authentic, if you're not genuine, if you're not just like a good person and you're just screwing people left and right, your, your, your shelf life isn't very long. Like you're gonna, you're gonna fall off pretty soon. It's not an accident. Like nothing is an accident. There's a reason right. why people have sustained careers and loyal followings and people who show up for them. It's because they have the work ethic, the tenacity, and the dedication, period. Uh, here's another one. Uh, my fiance asked, uh, so we got recently engaged in January before you know the world went to shit. I know you got recently engaged as well. Congratulations. Uh, what has, thank you. What has that experience been like for you know you and your partner being engaged in kind of that relationship that you guys have now? And how has it uh, persevered through this crisis? You know, we've been together for like over four years. It really felt, I know I'm supposed to say that it was like this game changing experience, but it really felt like any other day. I mean, I think he was really excited. He did the whole ring moment. I am kind of like, okay, what's next? Like now we're going into Bridezilla mode. Um, we started planning our wedding, but then, you know, COVID obviously has delayed that. We're not sure when that's going to happen. Um, but Phil is an incredible human being and, and someone that, you know, I, I knew for such a long time that we were going to be together forever. So I, I should, I shouldn't say this, but I'm going to, yeah, I thought of it more as like, okay, I got to check this off the list and like, we're ready for the next stage of life. Right. I mean, it's all really a bunch of formalities, right? Like just the whole right. marriage situation. Like I think that, and I, I, and I say that like in a very respectful way, it's that, it's not that I don't want to get married and obviously I do, but just the whole process, right? You know, you have to sign paperwork and you have oh. to like this whole, and you got to pay right? for All it. The, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's just like, why can't we just let things be just love the other totally. person? Enjoy life. Oh. <laughs> and we started with like a 40 person wedding. Oh no, we're going to do yeah. 90. Oh, we'll do 170. We'll do two set. It's like, I'm now doing like a bar mitzvah. It's, it's out of control. <laughs> I mean, yeah, ours started at 520 and thanks to COVID, it might go down a lot more to your level. 20? Who are you I mean, it's inviting? An Armenian wedding. Oh, Armenian it's Armenian wedding. wedding. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's Armenian a big wedding. You got to invite everyone. Everybody. I mean, I'm going to invite you soon too, if we continue. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, for sure. Through. I'm getting invited. Yeah. Yeah, you know what I mean? So it's like, it's crazy stuff. Suddenly you're inviting you for too much time. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much for this conversation. Thank you guys. This has been great. <laughs>